Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the BSD Dev Room at FOSTEM 2017. Thank you for being uh, such a large crowd here. I see a lot of faces I know, which is good. Um, I'm going to tell you as like I'm, I'm going to tell you as my first as our first talk today in this Dev Room uh, about how we package um, so, uh, source code of programs written in Go in package source. So first of all, I would like a quick show of hands. Who here knows what package source is? Okay, so I don't need to explain it for a long time. Who here knows about Go? Uh, most people, that's great. It's awesome. Um, so, um, so package source, obviously, is the NetBSD packages collection, um, which doesn't mean it runs only on NetBSD. It means it's maintained by people in the NetBSD project. Uh, it contains uh, over 17,000 packages. Um, it's been growing. It's still growing after all these years. And the, the really cool thing about it is that it runs on 23 different platforms out of the box. So that includes uh, any sort of BSD you might want to throw at it, like NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly, Bitrig, whatever. Um, it includes Linux, uh, even even Windows. The you know the Bash for Windows thing that they're doing is basically Linux, and uh, Cygwin, I believe, is supported as well. Um, some cool <coughs> features that Package Source will give you: you can, uh, if you're one of, on one of the mainstream platforms, you can use uh, pre-compiled binary packages. There's something called Package In, which is a lot like apt-get, so really easy installation, upgrade, and so and so forth. Um, you can set it up unprivileged, that can be super, super helpful. That means you don't need root for uh, building packages or installing packages or using them. Um, so you could do a container-like thing if you wanted to, like poor man's Docker, so to speak, by, um, by having a private package source tree per major app that you just package together and it doesn't need root access to, to, to do anything, which is cool. And there is a, a separate uh, side project, it's called WIP, uh, w Work in Progress. Uh, so if you want to get started with package source after all that I've told you today, um, it's super, super easy to get an account for that. Um, it, uses, it uses Git, unlike <laughs> main package source, which uses CDS still. And it's very low barrier to entry, and it's really, really very easy to, to create packages. Um, to go a little more into detail, um, uh, a package in package source um, minimally needs four files. Uh, there are makefile, distinfo, deskcur, the description, and the plist, the packing list. So, so uh, the makefile is essentially um, a bunch of variables that are being declared, and then at the end you include a uh, one include line that does all the work. The dist info is automatically generated. It contains checksums for uh, the file you're going to download. Um, description is something you need to write. It's, well, it's one or two paragraphs describing the package. And the packing list, again, is auto generated by the infrastructure, is a list of files in the package, basically. Um, and uh, the installation of a, of a package source package or the build goes in these predefined stages. So that's a structure that's basically set in stone. Um, and it's, but it's worked really well over the years and it's a good structure. So I, th I probably forgot a bunch of stages here, but um, first of all, the first stage is fetch where you download the distribution file um, or you, know, you copy it from somewhere where you have it in your local repo. Then you check the, um, then you check the, the checksums to verify that you've actually got the correct file with the correct size. Um, then, then you build tools, you install dependencies that goes recursively, does the same thing for every package you depend on. Um, then you extract the source code, then you apply any patches on top of it if there are any. Then there's a stage called build where you do the actual, I forgot configure obviously. There's configure, then build. Um, then stage install, which is where you install it into a staging directory, uh, so-called destir. Um, and then the package stage, which takes whatever is in the destir, or rather the subset that's in the plist, <laughs> and uh, packs it together um, in a package. Um, 
And then package install takes that generated binary package and installs it on your system. Right. Now uh, we switch gears a little bit uh, and go into the world of, you know, Go. Uh, so it's a fairly pro uh, popular programming language, to put it mildly. Um, uh, it's, in fact, it's so popular that tomorrow there's going to be an entire dev room about Go-related topics in uh, the um, in the Depage room in the H building. Um, in the in the world of Go, there is a, a tool that's also called Go, um, and the Go tool handles, among other things, fetching, building, and installing Go programs. And let's look at how it does that. Um, here's a simple example. So I I chose I chose a random package that was the last package I was working on. Don't read too much into it. Um, so what's happening here is uh, you tell it to go get uh, something. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small. Um, the the three dots at the end is a um, is like a, is a is a meta pattern. It's like a star, except it matches subdirectories. So every that means I want to install everything that's under this path. Uh, download it and install it. And so go get will download that. Uh, you notice import paths look like URLs. That's intentional. Um, then it sees that there is a dependency in there that we don't have. So it tries to download that. There's this little, of, little bit of a special case because uh, it's sort of a sim link, so to speak, from an import path to an actual Git repo somewhere else. Um, then it downloads that. And then it builds the things in opposite order. Um, sounds you know similar enough to what we what we did in in package stores, right? Um, and uh, there's this thing called the go path at the top. If we look at this go path that we've just created, uh, you'll notice that there are no two two directories called source and package. There might be a third directory called bin if there was a binary. Um, and so source contains the source code for those things that we downloaded. Um, and it's arranged by import path. That's a uh, that's a standard way uh, that Go arranges its source code. And then the package subdirectory has a another subdirectory for your platform. Uh, so from the same source tree, you know, you could build for as many platforms as you want, and it would not conflict. And then it has uh, you'll notice it has one level of directories less because each subdirectory in source is conceptually one package corresponding to one file in PKG. Now, uh, there is some mismatch between that, because uh, it does download, then discover something, then download some more stuff, then, then discover some more, and then build stuff recursively in the middle. Um, so that doesn't quite fit with the model we have in, in package source. Um, now, there's two possible approaches to this. Um, uh, one of them is to basically ignore the ecosystem to say we only pa we only package go itself and then tell the user just run go get something something and you'll get your binary uh, and in fact that is what um, the people from the go team have recommended to me um, but I think that's unsatisfactory that's clearly not what <coughs> you want because uh, at some point there is some software that's written in go that somebody wants to to run and you know you don't want as you don't want them to be special snowflakes. You want them to be packages such as all the rest of your system. In package source, for example, we have a linter called package lint that's written in Go. So it's actually um, become a quite an important topic for a bunch of developers. So let's deal with it. Um, some, more, some more thoughts on this is um, most of the packages uh, or the individual, say, downloadable units in this Go ecosystem are kind of small and do relatively little and in that they're similar to Perl packages or maybe the the tech live ones or so so there's like hundreds of tiny ones um, or if you've ever used node.js and you've used npm like you install some some random tool you do npm install bower for example and then you look in your npm modules directory and all of a sudden you have 350 modules in there and it's a little bit like that um, now the binaries, once they're built, they don't depend on anything really because they're statically linked, except maybe libc, but okay. And so uh, 
so once you've built your binary package, you can actually install it without having all the intermediate libraries there. So that's kind of a nice property. So we have a framework in package source um, called gopackage.mk that allows you to write uh, these packages relatively easily. We're going to go through this go OVH that we've seen before, um, see how that works. So first step when you want to package this thing, we go to its home page or to its GitHub in this case, and we download the latest release. Oh look, there are no releases. Mm. Yeah, okay, so instead we, we search for the latest commit and take that date and take the, the, the SHA-1 of, of the commit, which is a, an endless hex string, and then we stick that in our make file. Um, here's, an, here's the actual make file for this thing, except there's one bit missing. Um, so you notice the, the, the version number is a little bit awkward. Um, we've chosen a category. Uh, we have this, this weird tag thingy here. Um, and then the, the more interesting bits for, for Go specifically is probably this, um, this block here. So, uh, so the Go source path is basically where in, in your Go path this thing would, uh, would be placed. So it's a, the, the import path you want for that package in the end. Um, and the Go disk base is the directory name that your GitHub download will have because it's if you just extract the file, it will not be in the correct directory. So this does a little bit of gymnastics to move it into a newly created Go path, so to speak, um, to this subdirectory. Um, and then you build, and it looks like this. Again, apologies for the, for the uh, font size. Uh, and there's, this here happens. Well, of course, there was a dependency. We don't have that package. Uh, wait, you say, I, I have that package from earlier, right? I downloaded it. But yeah, you, you don't want that. You, do, you want your, your build to be hermetic in the sense that it uses only um, dependencies it has actually declared um, so that in the end your dependency tree makes, makes sense. So, it, so it's clear that it's a good thing that it's not finding it. Now, let's add the dependency. Uh, we, we add an include for uh, the build link 3.mk of this, of this package, which conveniently enough already exists. Uh, then we rerun make, and you see it's kind of unspectacular, not very spectacular, it builds. Um, so what happened now? Um, what did this include build link something something actually do? Um, so build link is a framework part of package source. It was written originally for, I suppose, C, the package is written in C or C++. Um, many of these use autoconf. And if you're trying to package something that uses autoconf, um, you know, it checks for presence or absence of certain libraries. So if you happen to have an extra library installed that the package may link against, it can add that as a dependency, and then it's not recorded in your package, but the binary does depend on it. Um, so that's a big problem. I think OpenBSD had a long, long history of sort of purging unwanted dependencies. Um, uh, package source did this building thing instead, and it turns out, uh, and turns out it works beautifully for, uh, for Go, because what we do, we, um, we create a shadow Go path uh, where we link in the entire source code and, pack and, and, also, um, and also the package files, like the entire contents of all the declared dependencies. Um, and then we set the environment variable to tell the Go tool that it should look there for code. Um, and that works just fine. I'll show you how the building 3.mk works. In this case, we, uh, I show you the one for this package because we want to allow other packages to depend on it, obviously. There's a little tool called create build link that basically creates this thing on its own. Um, so what it does, this is the magic bit here, the build link content filter. So it takes the entire contents of the go pkg subdirectory, which is where we install the, the source and pkg directories. Um, and adds and, and build links it in. Um, the dependency method is build, so that means it will not be a dependency of the final package. It's only a build dependency, which is what it is. Um, 
And here it has an, we have repeated this in Clue. So if you depend on Go OVH, it'll transitively depend on Go INI so we can actually build the thing. Um, this has uh, another very nice property and also a very important property, the, the compiled source code. Um, so the way the, Go, the, the way the Go tool works is a little bit like make. Um, if, um, you know, if any of the source files are newer than the binary file, then the binary file is stale, so it needs to be rebuilt. If, if your compiler is new, is a different version than the compiled file, the compiled file is also stale, needs to be rebuilt. However, you can't just rebuild random things that are already installed because their file checksums have been recorded. And also the directory is hopefully read only. Um, so when it, when you build link the tree in, um, then it can replace those compiled files with newer versions if it needs to. And it doesn't count because you just delete the, the, the shadow go path once you're done. So that is actually, that solves a lot of problems and it makes it uh, kind of uh, lower the mismatch between uh, package source and, and, and Go. Um, now, I would say, so, so this is basically where we are, but the problem is it's, it's still relatively tedious. So to give you an example, um, because anecdotes are totally uh, what we need. To give you an example, I'm working on something called Caddy. It's a web server written in Go, uh, very high performance, very cool project. Uh, encryption built in, zero config, and so on. Um, has hundreds of other Go packages that it depends on. And if you package them one by one, then you're going to be like me two months later still packaging things. Um, so, yeah, this could be automated, right? That's the next logical step in, in this direction. However, it's not trivial. Uh, you've seen a lot of metadata that I've manually added, basically. Like, um, you know, because there was no release, the uh, finding the latest commit and date and so on and putting that in. Uh, the comment, which I have mentioned, is a one-line description of the package. I don't know where to get that from. What's the license of the package? There's not, there's no, so, so unlike Perl packages, there's no manifest that has these things recorded in a neatly consumable way, um, which is very sad. Um, uh, then the long description, uh, readme.md files sometimes leave a lot to be desired. You can't just take the first few paragraphs and say, this is my description, it doesn't work well. Um, then the whole canonical import path versus source code location that uh, the tooling can help you. So you saw the Go tool discover where the thing actually is. You can use that programmatically. Uh, the same way you could do dependency resolution programmatically, you can ask the Go tool which, which de other packages does this thing depend on, but please filter out the standard ones. And then you match that against uh, packages you have already in your tree so you can write the depends files. That would be maybe a worthwhile first step. Um, then some, some of those have extra dependencies for testing. Unfortunately, package source doesn't have a concept of uh, what OpenBSD called regress depends. Um, so you can't say package XY is only used for the regression tests. Uh, the way I've been doing that is um, I put it in the, the build dependencies in the make file, but not in the build link file. But it's probably not the greatest solution. Um, sometimes things that depend on C libraries, like you have Go wrappers uh, that, you know, wrap a C library. Um, yeah, so I've previously written such a thing for Perl packages, actually. It was called cpen to port. Um, or cpen to package on the on the package source side, uh, so maybe yeah maybe I should tackle that at some point. Um, would be a worthwhile thing to do, I think, because the Go ecosystem is large and has many interesting things that may not be. I would say may not be known enough in in, in like the circle of people who are likely to use say NetBSD, but there's some cool stuff in there, um, and so, so as my last um, sort of point I'm trying to make and that I also um, promised I would make in the, in the description of this talk is as an upstream author, uh, like as the author of a Go package, what can you do to make it easy to package the software that you have written? <coughs> so my first, my first point is 
give us releases, please. Like a lot of the Go community does never releases anything. They just push on GitHub continuously. Um, and if you do releases, please also do release notes because we like seeing what changed. Um, um, then we've we've sort of tackled the whole Go get uh, process. So it would be nice if your software supported that. And um, so I've seen I've seen things. I don't remember what what, pro, uh, what project this was. It delivered an install .go and said just ru just compile and run this thing and it'll do the rest. This is not likely to work, unfortunately. And the 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 most horrible part is when your software during build, for example, this install .go, during build decides to download more stuff. Um, that does not fit at all with the hermetic um, building that we would like to have. And that is and, um, just necessary for, rep for making any sort of reproducible package out of your code. So don't do this, please. And also, um, please, some, some readmes are really bad, as I said. Please put more sensible descriptions. What, what does your thing actually do? Maybe for for just libraries, it might be more, more fruitful to look at the Go doc output uh, because many people have crappy readmes but good comments in the code. That might be an idea. Um, and avoid circular dependencies. That's a good one as well. Um, so the Go get works on the level of package, like it builds package by package. Um, whereas package source typically works on a per, per dist file. So basically all of for example, golang.org slash x slash net is one, one entity for us. And there, there used to be a circular dependency, it might still be in there. There's a package in GoNet that depends on um, the metadata package from, from the Google Cloud uh, libraries. And then, there's, and then there's another package in the Google Cloud libraries that depends on something from the xnet repo. So if you try to build first one, then the other, you're going to fail. Um, so you have to split one of the two to get rid of the circular dependency. And that's really crappy, so please don't do it. Um, and that's mostly it. Uh, thank you. Here are some links. The first one uh, is the link to this event. You can leave your feedback here. Uh, I'll upload the slides a little bit later. Um, then package source org. Don't need to explain, Golang org. Also, package source SE is super cool. It's a browsable package directory of the things that are in there. So you can search for something like Go OVH or whatever, and it will pop up a little page that, says, that gives you the description, gives you a link to the sources. Uh, you, can, you can click on the dependencies, reverse dependencies. That's really nice. And I have one bonus slide. Maybe if there are some questions first. Are there any questions? Okay, here's the bonus slide. Um, so NetBSD um, is kind of cool if you're using cloud stuff because of its Xen support. It runs great on a bunch of Xen-based uh, cloud solutions, such as Amazon EC2. Um, and uh, starting from NetBSD 7.1, our release candidate one, <laughs> um, uh, we finally have enough uh, stuff to be able to run on the Google Compute Engine which is sort of KVM based. Um, however, there are still a couple of, of bugs. It's, it's not quite easy to, to uh, create such images. So there's sem semi-official uh, support coming. Um, this is something I've been doing in my day job. It's not released yet. That URL doesn't work yet. It'll be there in one or two weeks. Um, <coughs> And it's basically a script uh, where you can enter a release and a platform, 386 or AMD64. Uh, it builds you a, uh, an image, and then you can upload, and, and there's a readme that explains how to use it. You can upload that to uh, Google Cloud Platform and create your own NetBSD VMs. Thank you very much.